So welcome back, everybody. Um, in this next session, we are, we're going to continue the general theme of microbiological risk assessment. And already we've had three excellent presentations, um, one on measuring the global burden of disease, and then two other uh, presentations looking at ranking in different ways, um, hazard food combinations, and how we can contribute to decision making on that global burden. And now we're going to move in, into a more challenging area and explore some of those specific challenges related to the uptake of microbiological risk assessment. And it is now more than a decade since Codex put together the risk analysis principles um, and also the guidelines on microbiological risk assessment. And I see around the room from the sessions this morning, there's a number of people that were involved in that significant amount of work. And the challenge before us now is, um, as expected, how do we actually turn those principles and guidelines into practical use for risk managers? And uh, we're going to hear further this morning uh, about some of the specific challenges. And more importantly, I think, is to think about the opportunities that um, our greater depth of knowledge will provide um, by a closer examination of some of these challenges. So now it's my privilege to, um, to welcome Dr. Fleming Scheutz. Uh, Fleming works at the Staden Serum Institute in Denmark. He's head of the WHO Collaborating Center for Reference and Research on Escherichia and Klebsiella. And this is also the National uh, Reference Center for Denmark for these organisms. And Fleming's primary interests are in identification and characterization um, and typing and the epidemiology of the pathogenic E. coli. So welcome, Fleming. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation, chairs and distinguished delegates. Uh, in 15 minutes, it'll be quite hard for me to go through all the typing methods that we use in microbiology. So I have chosen uh, the uh, case of uh, virucidotoxin or toxin producing E. coli to illustrate what typing methods can be applied. And I'm sorry to say that this will, not, this will then hopefully result in you not looking at VTIC as a single pathogen as it has been referred to earlier on during these presentations. One reason for choosing this organism is, of course, the severe sequelae hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is a life-threatening disease uh, and characterized by a triad of acute renal failure, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. You can see the red blood cells here are fragmented, and the uh, risks of blood clotting is increased. And then there's thrombocytopedia, which is a drop in the uh, blood uh, platelet count. Once upon a time, and that's 30 years ago, hemorrhagic colitis was associated with a rare Escherichia coli serotype called 0157. Now, recently at the International, Ninth International Symposium of VTEC 2015 in Boston, non 0157s share the scene with 0157. We had reports of uh, different serotypes from cases of HUS. O26H11 is now the primary cause of HUS in Italy. H 80 h 2 in France. O104H4 continues to be found around the globe, including the Republic of, of Georgia. And in Spain, we've seen uh, very exotic serotypes. Of note is the O59H19, which is an enteroaggregative E. coli found in Argentina together with other serotypes. So there are two main features of STEC or VTEC, and one is the EAE gene, which is encoded on a pathogenicity island referred to as Li, the locus for enterocyte effacement. And it allows the bacteria to destruct and adhere to the epithelial cells in the gut. The other feature is the uh, capability of these bacteria to produce a very potent toxin called either VT1 or VT2 or ST1 and STX1 or 2. And the effect of the toxin can be seen on virus cells. Here they are quite healthy, and here they've been destroyed and killed by the toxin. It's uh, stipulated that at least one molecule or just one molecule is capable of killing a cell in the kidney. 
What you may not be aware of is that there are many different types and variants of these toxins. And this is a family tree of toxins uh, and uh, consensus was agreed during the eighth uh, VTIC symposium in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, where the uh, ones are divided into three subtypes, A, C, and D, and the twos are divided into A, B, C, D, E, and F, and G. And you can see that there are quite a number of variants within these uh, types here. So we've studied the prevalence of these types in our patients that have reported either HUS or not HUS. And as you can see on this slide, VTX1 is by far the most dominant, followed by VTX2A. In red, you see cases of HUS. And if you zoom in on these, you will note that VTX2A is implied in almost all of these cases. There are exceptions, but they are quite um, unusual. These are the EA positives, and if you look at the EAE negatives, you see that VTX2A is also what was found in the German outbreak strain on a 4 h 4 and you have uh, one or two cases with other variants. They are very unusual clinical presentations, so they are not uh, the customary picture. So our conclusion in Denmark is that HUS-associated VTEC, we abbreviate them HUSEC, um, a, a term or an acronym invented by my German colleagues, and we say that VTX2A is uh, associated with HUS, and then to a lesser degree, we have reports of VTX2D. So we've developed this protocol for typing, and that can be used to ascertain the different uh, risks associated with HUS. Now, the toxin is encoded by bacteriophages. Here are two examples a VTX1 encoding phage and a VTX2 encoding phage. But actually, they come in all different sizes and forms. Moreover, they are also found in healthy humans. This is a study done in Spain by my colleague Maite Muniz and, and her colleagues. And you can see that these bacteriophages are found in healthy humans in 62% of 100 healthy individuals showing no enteric symptoms. And actually, most of these, listed here by asterisk, they will also be able to colonize uh, bacterial hosts. In the recent symposium that I mentioned, a study had been done including food handlers and uh, workers in daycare centers in Japan during the period of 10 to 12, and healthy carriers had an incidence or a prevalence of 84.2 per 100,000 compared to the 2.1 that we see so in diarrheal cases. So a 40-fold higher prevalence of isolated VTIC bacteria in healthy carriers than in diseased um, patients. STX phages are also found in food. This is another study from Spain where 100% of the minced meat samples and 69% of fresh salad samples had STX phages in food. So if you use just the PCR to see if STX was uh, present in these foods, you would find them positive, but they would only represent phages. Now, at least 50% of these phages are also infectious, that is, that they can go into other bacteria and propagate in host strains. Yet, in the area where this study was conducted in Barcelona, there's a very low incidence of VTIC infections. You can go on and look at these phages. They are quite resistant in the environment. And this is a study done by, by my Italian colleagues of the phage that infected the O104H4 strain in the German outbreak. And they compared the phage genome with the phage found in another outbreak in France 20 years prior to the German outbreak and found that the phage in this serotype 0111H10 is 99.9% .9 identical to the phage found in the German outbreak and very, very similar to a strain which is of a different serotype 0127H4 that caused four cases of HUS in 2013. So actually, we are looking at the phages infecting different host uh, bacteria. So what can we 
I think that the buzzword these days is next generation sequencing or whole genome sequencing. And if you look into the uh, genome sequences, um, my colleague Chad Lang from the Public Health Agency of Canada looked into the uh, available sequences and found that at the moment there are more than 2,324 different whole genome sequences representing different serotypes. And I'd like to zoom in on a study done in the UK recently where uh, Tim Dolman and his colleagues have studied and used phylogenomics to understand the emergence of the 01057 uh, uh, strains in, in the UK. So here's a, a family tree. It's called a maximum clade credibility tree of 530 of the more than 1,000 strains, but representing strains where there's a uh, more than 25 SNP difference. SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. So each of the branches in the tree represent a strain which has a minimum of 25 SNPs to the next branch. You can think of a SNP address much as you think of a zip code. If you type in 12345 on this website, you end up in Schenechtedi in the state of New York uh, in the US and you can use the SNP address to then study the 01057 uh, prevalences. At the bottom of this family tree, you have the number of years. So what Tim has been able to demonstrate is that the 0157 strain probably originates a little uh, more than 400 years ago. And then in the 1840s, it started its uh, dispersion. So the ancestral 0157 state is an STX2C called lineage one. Then there's an early rapid uh, diversification over the next couple of years. You have the Shiga toxin complement insertion sites that are relatively stable, but in later years, approximately 60 years ago, STX2A phages moved into the 01057 strains on multiple different occasions, um, both in the 1A, the 1B, and, the, and so on. So what this concludes is that there's a diversification of the uh, 01057 strain. Now, Tim and his colleagues, they have studied uh, the association, association with these lineages and then HUS. And as you can see, uh, STX2A is also involved where you have a higher prevalence or attack rate of uh, HUS. And it's reflected also in the severe disease, severe disease if you measure that by hospitalization and bloody diarrhea. What you can also do is you can dis, uh, study the uneven diversity of 0157 in the UK. So here you see that all three lineages, one, one, two, and three, with a SNP difference of more than 250, and a representative of each of those that reduces the number to 54 different uh, representative strains, all three lineages Ha comprise more than 50% of that lineages. These three clusters contain 84% of all cattle isolates in the UK. And furthermore, those where there are less than five isolates, they are associated with foreign travel or imported food. So you have a global dispersion of 0157 and then a regional expansion in the cattle reservoir in the UK. And likewise, it's been shown for the US, for Australia, for Argentina, you have a local or a regional expansion of the 0157 strains. So this was used in a, an outbreak recently where the uh, proportion of exposed patients indicated prepacked salad, pasteurized milk, other salads or raw fruit, as something that they had eaten prior to the onset of disease. Now the implicated 0157 strain had a SNP address of 1835, 397, 765, and a very strong northwestern geographical signal, including some uh, possible environmental exposures. And on the picture, this is just taken from Google map, you see um, a field where watercress was grown. And what you don't realize is that some of these small dots here, they are actually uh, representing cattle uh, grazing next to the field where the watercress was grown. 
And uh, as I mentioned, there were some possible environmental exposures. But certainly the uh, SNP address of the 0157 strain could point in this direction and um, I think investigations are ongoing uh, to see if you can isolate the strain from either cattle or environment. The last thing I'd like to say is that once upon a time we had hamburgers and ground beef as a primary source of 0157. But two studies at the VTEC 2015 demonstrated that these days, as I mentioned, you may have autocrats and other fresh produce, but you also have a number of risk factors. These are, this is a summary of studies done in the Netherlands and the US where swimming and contact with ruminants, contact with other persons with diarrhea, visiting farms, steaks and ground beef, travel, but also host factors play a role. And in the US study, these were anti-acids, anti cardiovascular disease, and other gastrointestinal infections. And finally, in the US, Hispanic ethnicity, probably associated with consumption of specific foods. So we need epidemiology to go uh, hand in hand with our new technology and typing measures. I think basically what I've tried to say here is that we, when we look at the MRA, we can identify the hazard by either PCR or subtype uh, or, or whole genome sequencing of the different toxin subtypes. We can also characterize both the bacteriophages and their hosts using whole genome sequencing. And it seems to be, to be very promising that we can use whole genome sequencing in, an, in, in, a, in the assignment of SNP addresses to these bacteria. Now, this study has only been done for 0157, but I think it, it applies for many other uh, bacteria, including uh, ETEC and EPEC, that we saw were primary sources of mortality in many countries around the world. We need, for exposure assessment and risk characterization, a combination, I think, of whole genome sequencing and epidemiology. And I think it hasn't been stressed enough today that we really need strong epidemiological tools to assess uh, the, the, the risk. So with this, thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues at uh, Public Health England and Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, Stefano at the uh, Instituto Superiore di Sanità here in Rome, and Maite Moniz at Barcelona University. And thank you very much for your attention. So thanks very much, Fleming, for a fascinating presentation. Um, have we got a question or two for Fleming? Um, so I, I'm, of course, all for the, the use of NGS, but where do you think we should take the viral microbiome interactions and particularly the bacteriophage information that's in there? And how do you see that evolve? I certainly think that we need more studies. At this symposium that I was at in Boston, it was clearly shown that the bacteriophage takes over control of the bacterial genome and we don't really know how that's done. Some studies show upregulation of adhesion factors and some so show downregulation. What was even more fascinating was that in the cattle reservoir, you could see a downregulation of the immune uh, genes involved in immune response in cattle, especially in super shedders that shed high numbers of uh, 0157. So there's a whole new area, I think, of interplay between the phages, their host bacteria, and where they are in the host. And I think this, this uh, I can't answer the question because it's a whole new area where uh, a lot of factors are at, at play. What I hope to, to show here is that, that VTEC is not a single pathogen. We have a lot of healthy carriers that complicates the whole picture. If you did a case controlled study in Japan, you would come up with the conclusion that VTEC is not a pathogen. Thank you, Ari. Thank you, Fleming, uh, for a very interesting talk. I, I actually have two questions. One is 
Can you explain a little bit more about this uh, SNP address and how that's linked to the geography? I didn't completely follow that. And the second is, um, a couple of years ago in the Biohaz panel, we published an opinion uh, about defining the top five or the top six uh, E. coli uh, strains using uh, the, the O antigen, uh, basically. And, and we already said that it would be desirable to do it more on a molecular basis to look at, at the toxins. Uh, so listening to your presentation, it looks like we are taking a big step now towards defining the most hazardous uh, uh, VTX strains as uh, VTX uh, 2A. Are we there already? So can this knowledge already be applied to advise to the European Commission to rethink their whole uh, idea of uh, which of the VTX strains are most dangerous to human health? The last question first, yes, I think we can use it to identify and we do need to have a molecular approach. Uh, but it's not a simple answer. Um, STX2A is not the only factor. There are a lot of bacterial factors also that you have to include. We actually also saw reports of cases of HUS from STX2F strains. But in combination with virulence factors that are known in E. coli and that could play a role. So I think we are looking at a dynamic moving target um, where it is a cocktail of genes that uh, are implicated in severe disease. And we need, uh, I think uh, NGS or whole genome sequencing will definitely answer a lot of that. Now your first question, the SNP address. The SNP address is based on comparison of your unknown sequence with a reference strain. And Tim is using the Sakai strain from uh, Japan as his reference. And then the core genome uh, is analyzed. That is, the core genome is what's common to all the strains in his collection. And if there's a more than 500 SNP address, they get the first digit. So all the strains with a 500 uh, SNP difference, they get one, two, three, four, five. The next level is 250, then there's 100, and the 50, and five. And if you have less than five SNPs, the strains are very, very similar. And you can actually begin to study the turnover of SNPs in outbreaks and so on. And using this method, Tim has been able to demonstrate that they probably, we, you, you touched upon that yourself this morning, they probably overlooked more than half of the outbreaks small outbreaks that they had in the UK over the past uh, 20 years. And I think my, my advocating the SNP address as a way to go ahead is that we have a lot of strains in our collections already. So we can do retrospective characterization of our strains and we can attribute them to different sources or regions or countries. And I think that would definitely help us in, in, uh, in, in food safety. We had an outbreak of listeria last summer, and when we got the first food isolate from a prepacked uh, rolled sausage, we could identify the source immediately using this SNP approach, a different approach, but still a SNP uh, approach. And this summer, we also had the same strain pop up in a patient and could point again to the source. And we've done that for several of our listeria outbreaks. So I think. What I've shown you is just for VTEC, but I think it be, can be used for many of the other enteropathogens. Okay, so Ari slipped in two instead of one, Moe, so I'm sorry you took your slot. We, we have to move on. Thank you very much, Fleming. Thanks. Could we please show our appreciation? <laughs> and welcome um, Marion to the stage.